Go ahead and just shake the music down a little bit. Make your microphone shut on. All right, now you can hear me. Wow, there we go. Let's stand together. Amen, amen. We're glad you're here. Let's worship the Lord today. Janelle and the team, come and lead us. Give the Lord a praise. Amen. If you're a child of God, say amen. 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 And wonderful to know the Lord Jesus as Savior and Lord of your life. And uh, this morning we uh, want to continue to remember those that are hurting in prayer. And appreciate you praying for my wife and her family and uh, her sister Helen. This is the third uh, sibling now that's gone to heaven. And uh, this on Friday, her oldest sister, Helen, uh, went home to be with the Lord. Remember Ken and his family in prayer. My brother-in-law, appreciate you praying for him. Also continue to remember Erica in prayer. Erica is the daughter of, uh, the special needs daughter of the Embaus. And, uh, and uh, she continues to uh, amaze the doctors and uh, moves and opens her eyes. And I was moving her arms and legs and we thank the Lord for that continue to re, uh, remember her in prayer. Also, um, 
continue to remember J.P. Nelson and his uh, hip surgery that he'll continue to heal and his knee that's bothering him and um, others that are carrying some heavy burdens. Uh, maybe today you're carrying a heavy load and God can meet your need today. And let's pray for America. Let's pray for revival in America. Uh, we think of some of the shootings and even yesterday in Buffalo, uh, the mass shooting. Uh, folks, we need healing in our land like never before. Amen. Uh, so this morning, uh, if, if you have a need, just give it over to the Lord. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we're so thankful this morning we can come to you. We come to you, dear Lord, with heavy hearts and heavy burdens. There are some, dear Lord, that, uh, Lord, their, their need is, is great. Lord, they've got financial burdens, family needs. They've got stress and other things in their life that are going on that they can't even perhaps share with others. But, Lord, you know what's going on. And Father, today I pray for those in need. I think of Erica today. I pray that you'll continue to touch her. Amaze the doctors, dear Lord, of your healing power. I pray for Jan's family in this time of mourning and uh, Lord that you'll uh, just draw near to them during this time of the home going of Helen. I pray dear Lord for our bro dear brother JP that could not be with us this morning. And I pray for the shut-ins, Lord those that are sick and shut in that uh, Lord are not here today that can only watch online. I pray dear Lord for America. I pray Lord we'll see revival back in our land. I pray for a healing as we hear things going on with the abortion issues and Lord with the mass shooting. God, we need a healing of our land, I pray. God, help us as God's people to realize that righteousness exalts a nation, but sin is a reproach to any people. God, bring revival to our land, we pray. We love you. Change lives and hearts. Those that are watching online, those that are here in person, change our lives today. We give you the glory and the praise for what you're going to do. And all God's people said... Amen. Remain standing as we continue to worship the Lord.
Amen, amen. You may be seated. Again, we're glad you're here today. And uh, if you have a copy of the Word of God, go with me. We're going to look at two scriptures today. Uh, first of all, Matthew chapter 28. Matthew chapter 28. And uh, we're going to uh, uh, just uh, preach on that for a while. And also we're going to look at Romans chapter 6. So two important passages of Scripture this morning. I, uh, I am continuing our messages and, and, uh, in this series through uh, 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 basic Bible doctrines. Basic Bible doctrines. As we look at things in the Word of God, some basic things. And uh, today I'm preaching why every Christian ought to realize the importance of baptism. And uh, sometimes we skip over this, and so today we're going to cover and see what the Bible has to say about biblical baptism. Before we do that, our boys and girls, third grade and on down, can go ahead and go back to Children's Church. And uh, Ryan, uh, uh, Mr. Ryan is going to be uh, walking the children back there. Matthew chapter 28 in our Bibles, Matthew 28, okay? And uh, let me get there real quick. All right, how many are there? Say Amen. All right, let's go to our passage this morning. Matthew chapter 28, look at verse number uh, eight, uh, 19. Let's go to verse 18. And Jesus came and spoke to them, saying, All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go therefore, verse 19, and make disciples of all nations, notice, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. And then if you would please go over to the book of Romans. The book of Romans. Uh, right after Acts. Romans chapter 6. Look at verse 4. Here, uh, here in uh, Romans 6 we see this illustration of being dead to sin and alive to, to God. In this illustration of, now when the Bible speaks sometimes of immersion into the body of Christ, but also, or being baptized into the body of Christ, but also being baptized with water baptism. And a good verse is to use here in verse 4, therefore, Romans 6 verse 4, we are buried with Him through baptism into death, that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of of life. And uh, so this morning I want to preach on baptism as one of the most important, meaningful, and uh, beautiful experiences that we have as believers. Now, a lot of times people say this I believe in baptism, but baptism is basically just one of those church traditions. If you believe that, you're wrong, okay? And this is a command of the Scriptures. We just read it there in Matthew 28 in the Great Commission to go and to reach and to make disciples and baptize them in the name of the Father, Son, the Holy Spirit. Some believe that baptism is a Baptist doctrine and only a Baptist doctrine. Folks, that's wrong. If Baptist, uh, here's the point, if, if uh, baptism uh, is only a Baptist doctrine, then uh, we need to get rid of it because it ought to be a Bible doctrine. Amen? It's a Bible doctrine. And Hummer, stay with me. All right. Hummer, you're awake this morning. All right. All right. Good. All right. And uh, so, again, it's more than just a tradition or just a Baptist doctrine. It's more than just a Methodist doctrine, an Episcopalian doctrine, or, or, or any kind of a doctrine. Listen, what we have to do, we have to be biblicists and go and see what does the Bible say. Someone said, well, baptism, it's just incidental. It's really not that important. Now if that's what you think and that's your philosophy of thinking, listen, I'm glad you're here today because I want to show you that Jesus thought that baptism was pretty important. Now we know that baptism doesn't save, but listen, being baptized in this doctrine of baptism is important. It's not incidental. And so a lot of times we as believers minimize what God maximizes. Be very careful. Amen? Don't ever minimize what God has maximized. I'll say it again. Don't ever minimize what God has maximized. All right? You think of the ministry of the Lord Jesus. What did He do for three and a half years? He began His ministry. How did He start? By being baptized. All right? How did that, how did that conclude? Well, He gave us the great commandment. Uh, 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 command, commanding baptism, the great commandment for the church. And so when you think of how Jesus started for three and a half years, what did He do? He ministered, He taught, and, uh, and Jesus taught this. Jesus emphasized this. Jesus thought 
baptism was pretty important. And if Jesus thought that way, we ought to think that way. Amen? And so, first of all, I want to take a look at why Jesus and how baptism is so important, what Jesus thought about it. First of all, I want to talk about the method of baptism. Now, we baptize uh, what we call immersion. Say immersion. There you go. Someone said, well, the Bible teaches all types of modes of baptism. Folks, it does not. It absolutely does not. Now, there are some that practice sprinkling. There are some that practice pouring. Uh, but listen, there's only one type or mode of baptism that's taught in the Bible, and that's immersion. Now, go take your Bibles, go over to Mark chapter 1, Gospel of Mark, and let's see what Jesus did in Jesus' baptism in Mark chapter 1. And uh, we're going to look, look at a number of scriptures this morning, so try to follow us here, all right? Uh, uh, Jesus uh, was baptized here, Mark chapter 1, and in verse 9 it says this, And it came to pass in those days that Jesus came from Nazareth of Galilee. Am I cutting out here a little bit? It sounds like I'm cutting out. I'm going to go ahead and use this, uh, this other microphone, all right? So we'll shut this one up. All right, can you hear me now? All right, am I cutting out now? Am I now? I fooled you, didn't I? All right, good. All right. All right. Look at verse 9 again. And it came to pass in those days that Jesus came from Nazareth of Galilee and was baptized by who? John, notice, in the Jordan. In other words, in the river Jordan. Now, we're look at verse 10. And the Bible says, and immediately coming up from the water. Now, folks, if you've got to come up from the water, then you have to be down in the water to be baptized. So, Jesus was baptized by immersion. He had to come up from the water. Now, John wasn't baptizing because of a, the scenery of the Jordan River. It wasn't because it was, now listen, I've been to uh, Israel, and if, uh, if you've never been, uh, hopefully maybe sometime we'll be able to have it. How many like to go to Israel and make a visit to Israel, the Holy Land, all right? And, and, but anyways, I've been to the Jordan River, and uh, if people want to sell you water out of the Jordan River and think it's going to bring healing, listen, it's dirty water, Okay? I believe in the healing power of God, but uh, don't, don't fall for those on, that want to sell the Jordan River water to you. John wasn't baptizing because of the beautiful scenery of the Jordan River. Uh, again, we know the reason that John was baptizing that particular spot, uh, to realize Jesus traveled about 60 miles in order to get baptized. Because we know in John chapter 3, verse 23, the Bible says, And John was baptizing Anon near Salem. Why? Because there was much water there. That's what the Scripture says. They needed much water so that they could immerse those in baptism. It takes much water to baptize by immersion. Now, sometimes we, basically as Christians, we want... Uh, convenience, and we want the beauty of baptism. Folks, sometimes it's not convenient to be baptized. And we ought to get baptized not because of the beauty or the convenience. We ought to get baptized because of the conviction of what it says in the Word of God. And so uh, uh, we've baptized here. We have baptized since we started. We, this is our fourth building when we planted the church. Can you realize that now we're going to be uh, approaching 20 years? But we, 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 baptized, uh, we baptized in jacuzzis. Uh, the second building that we had over here in Riverside, we had a horse trough. All right? And uh, we had a horse trough. We actually baptized in a horse trough. And uh, we baptized, I baptized in lakes and rivers and so forth. Too many people, again, are looking for convenience and the beauty and everything else rather than being obedient to the conviction and the principles of the Word of God. Do you remember the story over there in Acts chapter 8? Go over there if you would, please. Notice in Acts chapter 8, Philip, that great evangelist that was uh, trying to uh, reach that Ethiopian eunuch there, and the, uh, he was led out in the desert by the Spirit and to reach the Ethiopian man. In Acts chapter 8, the Bible tells us in verse 36, Acts 8, 36, notice what it says. And now as they went down the road, they came to some water. And the eunuch said, see, here's water. What, who, what, what hinders me to be baptized, uh, from being baptized? Then Philip, the evangelist, said, if you believe with all your heart, you may. 
In other words, you have to be a follower of Jesus and believe in your heart. And he said, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. So what did he do? He commanded the chariot to stand still, and both Philip and the eunuch went down into the water, and he baptized him. And notice the next verse, next phrase. Now when they cut, came up out of the water. Folks, if you went down, thank God they came out. It wasn't sprinkling, it wasn't pouring, it was by immersion itself. So listen, the very first step of this doctrine of baptism is that immersion is the only scriptural mode of baptism the Bible teaches. The other stuff is man-made stuff, man-made religion, man-made doctrine. And uh, so when people say, I, I ask them, have you been saved? And, and uh, have you been scripturally baptized? I, I notice I word, use the word scripturally or have you followed the Lord in believer's baptism? Because that's what the Bible teaches. Amen? It's not, the, a lot of people get it mixed up. They get baptized and they get saved. You notice in scripture, every time they got saved, you notice in the early church through the book of Acts, they believed, they received the Lord, then they were baptized. So the mode is important. The second thing I want to show you is simply this, the example of the early church. The example of the early church. Baptism by immersion was originally practiced by all uh, the basic branches, I should say. Now think of a big tree and, and uh, the trunk of the tree and branches. And you have different groups, different denominations that come from that. And uh, what we call the, the, the branches and the, and, and, the, and the denominations that came from the early church. Sprinkling and pouring those modes of baptism began along the way when people were sick or bedridden. That uh, when people were sick, they wanted to pour, they wanted to sprinkle people, and so forth. And so baptism was, was, by sprinkling, was adopted by different groups. For instance, it was adopted by the Roman Catholic Church as the predominant method in the 13th century. But early church fathers, when you go back to the 1st, 2nd, 3rd century, the early church fathers, after the New Testament was written, guys like Tertullian in A.D. 200 says, We are all immersed, talking about baptism. Cyril, the bishop of Jerusalem in A.D. 340 said, The body is dipped in water. You look at the great denominations of our day and our history of our, of our nation. You think of the Methodist Church, and John and Charles Wesley started basically, we could say, the Methodist denomination. There was an evangelist during the Great Awakening named George Whitfield. How many have ever heard of George Whitfield? A great evangelist and preacher of the gospel. George Whitfield said this, who was a Methodist, and he was commenting on the passage that we read, Romans chapter 6 in verse 4. And he says this, he said, it's certain that the words of our text is an allusion to the manner of baptism by immersion. Even the Methodists that started the Method Methodist church actually declared that immersion was the mode of baptism. A guy named Connie Bear in Howison, who were the Episcopalians uh, that kind of helped found that. And they were commenting again on Romans chapter 6 and verse 4. They said, this passage cannot be understood unless it's understood that the primitive baptism was by immersion. John Calvin. How many have ever heard of John Calvin? John Calvin, of course, uh, uh, we would say that he came up with the doctrine of Calvinism, the tulip and that. And uh, he, uh, 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 basically, well, I would say the Presbyterian Church came from, the, from Calvin's theology. Here's what he said. He said the very word baptize signifies to immersion, and it was the certain practice of the church and the early church. How many have ever heard of Martin Luther? Lift your hand, Martin Luther. Martin Luther was the Catholic priest that wrote the, thesis, the, 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 the 99 Thesis on the Door at Wittenberg against the Roman Catholic Church when he read in the Scriptures, the just shall live by what? Faith. And so he began to, he started what we call now the Lutheran denomination, the Lutheran Church. He said this about baptism. He said, I could wish that he, the baptized should be totally immersed according to the meaning of the word. So even in the early church, even some of the denominations that we have seen throughout even our country started and, uh, and were at the very beginning of the roots of it, were believing and, and uh, practiced the mode of immersion. When you go to Europe today, you can go to Europe and you can find the old cathedrals and the old, uh, the, uh, 
uh, the, the old churches that were built like from the 13th century and on. And you'll find baptistries there that even during that time they practiced immersion because of the deepness of the pool. When, if you go to the Holy Land, you go to the, uh, the area of Qumran. That's where they found the Dead Sea Scrolls. I've been there. And uh, John the Baptist was from the Essenes and he grew up around there. They actually have excavated uh, even John the Baptist's uh, baptism. Was, there were pools of baptism where they practiced immersion. Here's the point, folks. It's in the Bible. It was practiced by the early church. Now let me tell you this about the word baptize, okay? The word baptize is basically an untranslated word in your Bible. It's really a Greek word meaning to immerse. King James of England back in 1611 he decided he wanted a copy of the Word of God in the English language, so he got these Bible translators together, good men, credentialed men, to, uh, to, uh, and he commissioned these scholars in 1611 to translate the Scriptures into the English language. Now, for the New Testament, they were, of course, went back to the New Testament. They went back to the original language of Greek and to the Greek manuscripts. And they came to this word, baptize. And it created, the, for these translators, a real problem for them. See, the word was a common word of that day in the ordinary language, and it wasn't a religious word. Let me say it again. It was just an ordinary word to baptize, but it wasn't a religious type of word or a scriptural type of word. In other words, if a woman was doing her dishes, she would say, I'm baptizing my dishes. If you're out playing in a swimming pool with your friends and, and Johnny and Tommy were playing and Tommy, you could say, Tommy baptized uh, Johnny or whatever. You know? In other words, he dunked them. He immersed them. If, uh, again, if, if, if I'm going to dunk you, the term would be I'm going to baptize you. That's how they would say it. So there, the word baptized at that time had no religious significance, but now it does. So when you were, use the word baptized today, that has a, a spiritual or a biblical uh, a, a significance to it. See, the word baptized for them was an untranslated word. Now here's what happened. It's been transliterated. You say, what, that, what does that mean? In other words, it's taken from one language and put into another language. You say, well, Pastor, why did these 1611 translators translate the word baptize in our, the old original King James 1611 version? Because, listen, King James at the time and the church in England at the time, they practiced the mode of sprinkling. And anybody that, again, that would have been alive or knew Greek or spoke Greek would have laughed at them if they used that word baptize. So these translators had a problem. If they took the word and made it sprinkling, they would be laughed at and ridiculed. But if they used the word immerse, the king, again, there would have been embarrassment. They, they, there would have been a problem with the translators. So what they did, they took the word, uh, they took the word baptizo, okay? This is a, the untranslated word, and made a New English word out of it, and all they did is, and they placed it basically into the English language. So the word baptize, when you read it, you can translate it. It means every time. Baptizo means immersion. See, in the Bible, if they wanted to use the word sprinkling, they would have used the word uh, ratizo. If they wanted to use the word to pour in baptism, they would have utilized the word in the Greek, epikio. So scripturally, the only word that's used to put under or to immerse is the word baptize or baptizo is the original word. And so again, the very words itself uh, in scripture, Jesus in the early church, all agreed in the mode of baptism. But I want to park here for the third point here, and that is, what is this whole meaning of baptized? You know, some people think, uh, uh, if you ask them, are they saved, they're ready for heaven, they'll say, I got baptized. How many have ever had somebody tell them, I got baptized? And so they're relating their salvation to baptism. There are some denominations that, uh, that uh, you are, you're saved by being baptized. And so what does the Bible teach? What is the significance about this thing of baptism? Again, go back to Romans chapter 6, and let's look at, at it, uh, these verses here. Now, 
What baptism does, it is a tremendous picture of the saving work of Jesus Christ. In other words, it's a picture of the gospel. And we read it here in Romans chapter 6 and verse 4 to verse 7. Pa uh, baptism is a picture, as you know, of the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And it's a picture of our death, our burial, and one day our resurrection, and of course our resurrection with Him. Now remember, baptism pictures or symbolizes the saving gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. And that's why... Follow me here. That's why the mode or the method of immersion is so, so very important. Suppose you say, uh, Pastor Mark Beagle, yes, uh, uh, listen, I know that your, uh, uh, your wife, uh, uh, and I know you're married, and someone came and said, hey, I, I know you're married, but uh, uh, do, you, uh, uh, do you have a picture of your wife? And I look at my wallet, and I find a picture of my car. And I pull out a picture of my car, and, I, and you say, well, that, is that your wife? I say, no, that's my car. Uh, 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 but that's not your wife. I say, well, any picture will do. Ah. Do you see what many Christians say? Immersion's not important. You say, well, it's a picture of the death and burial and the resurrection. And people will say, well, any picture will do. No, it won't. This is a picture, a baptism of the death, the burial, and the resurrection. And it would be a ridiculous statement. And, uh, and, and somebody says, well, I'm sure it doesn't look like your wife, you know, whatever. Listen, baptism is a picture. It's a picture. You go into the water. It's a picture picture that you're placed in a, let's call it this, a liquid tomb. We're buried, and we say we're buried with him in what? Say it louder. Baptism. Say it. We're buried with him in what? Baptism. So there's a burial in a li liquid tomb. When we come out, out of the water, that's the picture of the resurrection. We're raised to walk in newness of what, folks? Life. We're raised to walk in newness of life. And that's the gospel message. And baptism, when we're biblically and scripturally baptized, that is our identification with the Lord Jesus Christ. It's our identification with the saving gospel message. When Jesus was baptized, he was picturing his death. He was picturing his resurrection. He was picturing his burial, his resurrection for us. When we're baptized, what does that do? We're picturing our identification with his death and burial and resurrection for us. Now, look at Romans chapter 6, verse 4. This is interesting. It says there, therefore we are buried with him, uh, we were buried with him through baptism into what? Death. Think about that. Look at that phrase one more time. We're buried with him through baptism into death death. Now, you've probably not heard, maybe it's been a while since you've heard this, but if, maybe some of you have you never heard this. The baptistry, in a sense, is a funeral service in a liquid tomb. I got baptized in Gall Lake, Michigan. I'm sure there's no one here that's ever heard of that. It's not far from Battle Creek. How many have ever heard of Battle Creek? All right. How many have never heard of Battle Creek, Michigan? Okay. How many have ever heard of Kellogg's? Lift your hand. That's where they make all the cereals and so forth, Post and Kellogg's. I was baptized in, I think it was the month of April. Now, if you're from Michigan, you know that probably the ice is just melting probably end of March, 1st of April. I'll never forget my baptism for a number of reasons. And the, one of the first reasons is because it was cold. It was cold. But listen, when I got baptized... What I was symbol, what it was symbolizing is that it was symbolizing the burial of the old Mark Beagle. What well, it was symbolizing that the old Mark Beagle died, and baptism pictured the burial of the old Mark. By the way, there were you say, Pastor, if it was a funeral, were there any mourners there? Yeah, one. 
Glad you asked. It was the devil. Because before I got saved, before I got back, listen, the devil and I were pretty good buddies. I was going in his direction, and he was mourning that. The devil was, that's why when you get baptized, you make the devil mad. And you see some people that get baptized, and all of a sudden, boy, they begin to struggle. Why? Because all of a sudden, there's spiritual warfare going on. Because the devil gets mad when we're identifying that we are dead to the old self. And the only, again, he hated, that devil hated to see me die. He hated me to proclaim that the old Mark, does that mean perfection? No. He hated to see that the old Mark Beagle was proclaiming death to, to, the, old, to the, old, the old person. See, again, one reason to never get baptized before salvation, if you're baptized before you got saved, the, the, the world basically would be uh, like having a funeral before you die. I don't think any of you are going to have that. And don't ask me to do it, all right? See, what we're doing, look at that phrase again. We're buried with him through baptism into death. Take it into that liquid tomb. We're declaring to those that are there, those witnesses, those, by the way, it's always a wonderful thing to see new converts get baptized and being obedient, amen? We're witnessing that because they're saying to the old world, I'm dead to the old person. I've been saved. I've been born again. And by the way, when, you, when you're saved, you die to the old person. You died to the old way of living. That's your declaration. No, that's part of it. By the way, that's, and, and that's why salvation always has to come first. Now, we know the thief on the cross, uh, that the, he, Jesus died before the, the two thieves, and the, the one thief, Jesus said, today you'll be with me in paradise. The other one rejected the Lord. He did, and he didn't say get off, the, get off the cross and get baptized to get to heaven. He, Jesus said, today you'll see me where? In paradise. Now, now, baptism doesn't save you, but listen, it's the first step of being obedient. And so, again, they, uh, that's why it's always they were saved first. L let me just run through a few scriptures with you. Go back to Acts chapter 2. Acts chapter 2. You see it all through the book of Acts. Acts chapter 2. And look at verse 41. Acts 2 verse 41. Here's what it says. Then those who gladly received his word were what? Baptized. And that day about 3,000 souls were added to them. Go over to the 10th chapter of Acts. Acts chapter 10. Go back over there. Look at verse 46. Acts 10 and verse 46. Here's what the Bible says. For they heard them speak. Uh, uh, hang on a second. Oh, look at verse 47. Can anyone forbid water that these should not be baptized who have received the Holy Spirit just as we have? And so what they're saying, first you receive the Holy Spirit. You get saved. Then you're what? Baptized. Uh, look over at uh, Acts 16, verse 31. Acts 16. And here's what it says. Then they spoke the word of the Lord to him and to all who were in the, his house. And he took them the same hour of the night and washed their stripes. And immediately he and all of his family were what? Baptized. You see it here? First, he heard the word of the Lord. He, first, he believed on the Lord Jesus Christ. Then he was baptized. So it's always salvation, then baptism. So look, again, go back to Romans chapter 6. Romans 6. We're buried with him through what? Through baptism into what? Death. Say death. There you go. Now, when you're baptized, you're not only picturing your death with Jesus, but baptism not only pictures the burial of Jesus and your burial with him, but it also pictures the resurrection of Jesus and your resurrection with him. See, not only are you buried by baptism, but according to the Scriptures, you're raised again. And in verse 4 of, of chapter 6, verse 4 says this. It says that we're raised to walk in newness of what, folks? Of life. You see, that's why it's more than just... And there's a difference between the two, these two words of submersion and immersion. Submersion, what's the difference? Well, with submersion... 
You can submerge something, but it may not come back up. You see the difference? You go down, you put under the water, and then you come up out of the water. That's immersion, and that's to walking in newness of life. We're telling the world, I'm, I'm, I'm identifying with Christ. We're saying goodbye to the old world. We're saying hello to the new man. I'm walking in newness of what again? Life. I'm, demo- I'm telling up this picture. I'm presenting this picture of my symbolic baptism that when I go into this liquid too, I'm dying to, in death to the old person. I'm coming back and I'm coming out of the water and I'm picturing that I am alive in Christ. Just think of what all this pictures. I, I, I've been delivered from my sin. My sin has, is buried in the, in the grave of God's forgetfulness. Aren't you glad for that? Every sin you've ever done, every wrong you've ever committed, every foul thing that ever came out of your, your, your mouth, God has forgiven us, thrown it into sea as his forgiveness. He said, I've been delivered from my sin. My sin's buried in the grave of God's forgiveness. Hallelujah. Listen, I'm a new person. That's what we're declaring. Baptism is not only a picture of his death with him and my resurrection life with him, but it's also I think a picture of the ultimate thing, and that's our glorification one day. Look at verse 5 of Romans 6. We also shall be in the likeness of his what? Say it again. We shall also be in the likeness of his what? Verse 5. Verse 5. We shall also be in the likeness of his resurrection. Say resurrection. You're getting it. All right. You went from, uh, uh, from death to life. Now, we're talking about resurrection, resurrection life. See, one of these days, I'm going to have the body like the resurrected body of the Lord Jesus Christ. My sister-in-law, Helen, that went home to glory on, on Friday. About three months in the hospital. Foot amputated, ready to amputate another a limb, a leg, all the way up to the knee. Gangrene had set in. Kidneys were not functioning, even dialysis. Had a number of strokes the last couple of weeks. Had a couple of heart attacks the last couple of weeks. But I'm going to tell you, my friend, one day she's going to get a glorified body. Right now she's got her, she's not in any pain at all. Amen. We're going to have that resurrection body like the Lord Jesus. You say, Pastor, what's it going to be like? I don't know. We have some glimpse of it in Scripture. How many of you have found that the older you get, sometimes you get some aches and pains? Lift your hand. (laughs) Hang on a second. Lift your hand again. Too many. How many have no aches and pains right now? Lift your hand. No, you're good. You're good. Nobody. All right, good. Only the young. All right. And you're not going to admit. All right. Audrey, you're doing pretty good, aren't you? Ashley, you're doing pretty good. I saw your prom picture there. That was a pretty picture there. Uh, now I just embarrassed her there. Okay. I don't know who asked you, but you, you, didn't, you didn't get permission to come through your pastor about whoever asked you the prom. So we'll talk about this afterwards. But anyway, it's all right. <laughs> One of these days we're going to have a brand new body. <laughs> And all of that, the death, burial, and the resurrection, and walking in the newness of life, all all of that is identification. It's pictured in the baptism. Now, if I were the devil, and you could take any message out of the church, I mean, you could take any message out of the Bible, out of the church, and, 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 and what would it be? What would it be the gospel? wouldn't it? The devil hates the gospel. I mean, the devil doesn't care what you believe as long as you don't believe the gospel. And, um, and, and again, what is, what is the one ordinance that we as Bible-believing churches practice uh, that teaches the gospel over and over uh, and over and over again? It's, it's, it's this or church ordinance of what we call baptism, what the Bible calls baptism. The devil's done a pretty slick job, hadn't he, on some people to take this wonderful picture of the gospel 
out of churches all over America. There are churches that used to preach the gospel, and now today they're just institutions. They don't care if people get saved. They don't care if people follow the Lord in believer's baptism. It has, instead of being the, one of the main purposes of the church, of the Christian, is to share the good news, the gospel. It's way down on the list. See, baptism pictures Calvary, folks. It pictures the resurrection. It pictures, the, in a sense, the second coming. Just as I come up out of the water, Jesus is coming again. Amen? And uh, though my body may be in the grave, I'm coming up out of the grave. And just that, that old body's coming out of the grave, just like I came out of the water. Now, what's the motive of it all? What's the purpose of it all? What baptism really shows is that you have a new master in your life. What baptism shows is you are not in control, that Jesus is in control. That's why we have, we sing, I follow, I, I've decided to follow Jesus. That's what baptism is. I, I've said many times, I've used the illustration of a ring. A ring symbolizes something. It symbolizes that, that I, my love is to this lady right down here in the second row. And, uh, and by the way, in the first seat, I better sp uh, specific, be specific. I love you guys, but Jan, a little bit better, all right. Whew. I got out of that one, didn't I? All right. It tells the world, I, I can take this ring off, I'm still married. But it, what it does, it declares to the world that I'm not ashamed that Jan Beagle and I are married. And I, I belong to that sweet lady down there. And I want to present and let the world know that I love her. That's what baptism does. Why is it that some people say they're saved and they want to prolong this thing of getting baptized. The very first thing the Lord tells us to do, after we come to know the Lord and receive the Lord as our Savior, identify with me. Put the ring on, <laughs> in a sense. Don't be ashamed to declare to this world that I, the old Mark Beagle, the old self, is dead, and I'm alive into Christ. And I'm, I'm a servant of Jesus. That's a message to convey. That's a message to get out, amen, into a lost and dying world. That's a message that we, every Christian ought to tell people this week, the message of, of the gospel. And by the way, that was the mandate of the church. That's why I read Matthew chapter 28, verse 19 and 20. That's called the great commandment in the Bible. And again, what does he say? Jesus is, you know what they were? Jesus' last words. I have, uh, I, I've heard of preachers actually dying in the pulpit. Now, that would be a terrible thing. How many have ever heard of that? Now, I don't, I don't mean to be cruel or anything, but, but, but if, if something happened to me and I'm in the pulpit and I come and somebody says, you know, Pastor, are you okay? And I say, give me the microphone. I, all of us would probably listen what are pastor's last words wouldn't you think that's pretty important how many think that'd be pretty important you'd all quiet down listen pastor's got want to say, wants to say something let me tell you jesus's last words and they were pretty important go into all the world preach the gospel make disciples bring people to jesus and baptize them so friend if it was in his last words, go win people, baptize them. Baptism, yeah, it's not necessary for salvation, but it's necessary for obedience. And that's what the Lord's told us to do. With our heads bowed this morning, I wonder today, you say, Pastor, I've been saved but I've not been scripturally baptized. Now, you may have been baptized. You may have gotten wet. I, I've known people, they've been sprinkled. They've been poured on. They've been, you know, all kinds of things before they got saved. Folks, what you got? You just got wet. You say, Pastor, God spoke to me. 
today. And I realize I, I need to identify the Lord in believers. Baptism. We're not prepared to do it today, but we will be. We baptized, what, two weeks ago? Or I think two or three weeks ago. And I wonder, you say, Pastor, God spoke to me. I, I've been saved, but I, I, I've been baptized. Maybe you'd be baptized before you got saved. You did it in the wrong order. And you say, yep, I, I know I need that baptism. If you're watching online, get a hold of us this week. Let us know. Because, listen, it's important for us as believers to identify with his death, his burial, his resurrection. It's telling the world, I'm a follower of Jesus. It's telling the world, he's my master, he's my boss, he's Lord of my life. First of all, I'm going to ask this. I'm going to say, Pastor, I have been scripturally baptized, and I'm so proud and so glad I did it when I did it. Lift your hand. Yes, I've been scripturally baptized. God bless you. God bless you. Hold it up. Hold it up. Hold it up. Put your hands down. How many say, Pastor, I couldn't raise my hand. And I don't know for sure. I need, perhaps, I need to get baptized. Would you lift your hand up and say, pray for me. God bless you. Anyone else? I've not been scripturally baptized the right way, the scripture way. I'm not talking about Baptist way or any kind of man-made religious denominational doctrine. I'm going to say, preacher, pray for me. I need God bless the one. And, you, and there are some that are perhaps watching the line today. You needed this message because it was basic Bible doctrine. If you're here today or you're watching in line, you don't know Jesus as Savior and Lord of your life, today would be a pretty good day to get saved. Today would be a pretty good day to give your heart and life to the Lord Jesus. And so today, we're going to have prayer. We're going to have you stand. We're going to sing a song of invitation of God's dealing with you. Be obedient to the Lord. Heavenly Father, we love you. We are thankful, Lord, for your Holy Spirit and how you, Lord, uh, how you speak to our hearts. And, Lord, there are some that need to get right with God. They've been saved and baptized scripturally, but they're not serving the Lord the way they ought to. And, Lord, there are some that just need to make and pray about us some other areas that are going on in their life and give some things over to you. Lord, we turn this invitation to you and this prayer time over to you. Lord, uh, thank you for this message. Thank you for this great, great picture of baptism. We pray this in Jesus' name. Let's stand together. God's dealing with you today. You want to come and pray about some areas? You want to? You got a heavy burden, a heavy heart on some things in your life going on? You just want to come and pray for others and intercede for others? The altar is open for you. Come right now as we begin to sing. I'm forgiven because you were forsaken. I'm accepted. Reverse, come on. God's dealing with you. Come on. I'm forgiven because you were forsaken. I'm accepted. You were condemned. And I'm alive and well. Your spirit is within me because you died.
you may be seated. If you're watching online and you've never been scripturally baptized, it's time to be obedient to the Lord and let us know. We'll be happy to set that up. Ushers, should you come? If you're visiting with us again, thank you for coming and take a visitor's card from one of the chair pockets in the back there and fill out that visitor's card. We'll put you on our mailing list. We're so glad to have you here. Take a moment to do that. That would really help us and and uh, and, uh, and uh, we, we'd be uh, happy to have you do that. Just put that card in the offering plate, and, uh, and uh, we'll uh, put that on the mailing list. Let's pray together. Lord Jesus, we love you. Thank you for the opportunity to give. Dear Lord, of tithes and offerings, the Lord bless the gifts today. Those that are giving online, dear Lord, help them to be obedient as well. We pray in Jesus' name, amen. By the way, if you're watching online, you want to give, you just go to Your Liberty, Y-O-U-R, liberty.org, and you can give online. Hi, good morning. Welcome to Liberty in 90 Seconds. Well, don't forget today to buy your tickets for the men's stakeouts. The men's stakeout will be on June 11th, and it's going to be a wonderful time. So make sure you buy a ticket. And how about this? Buy extra tickets and invite and bring someone with you. It's going to be a wonderful time together, so you definitely don't want to miss out. So see Steve Sutton or Junior Carrillo today to buy your ticket or for more information about our men's stakeout. Then we want to invite you out to our July 3rd patriotic service. This is going to be a wonderful morning, so invite and bring someone with you. After the service, we will also have a potluck and a lot of activities for the kids, so bring someone with you and save the dates for our July 3rd patriotic service. Good morning, Liberty Church. What an amazing Sunday we've had. Hey, listen, I just want to give a reminder to all of our parents. If you're a grandparent, parent, it doesn't matter. Anyone that has a student, we want to encourage you to come to Kendall Hall right after service. We're going to have a meeting and really going to just express to you all the opportunities we have for your students to engage this summer. As we've been saying before, we've been encouraging our students and now we're encouraging you as parents to help your students re-engage, reconnect with the church, re-engage with community, right? The kids being with people just like themselves and more important, reconnecting with God. And so listen, we as a church are providing some opportunities for you. I encourage you to be there. This is going to be a very short meeting, but we want you to know how your students can connect. Listen, help us to help your children spiritually mature in their faith. We love you, we thank you, and I'll see you soon. God bless. All right, there we are. And uh, so make sure, men, let's stand together. All men, how many have already gotten your ticket so far? Lift your hand. A few of you, only a few. And it's important that you get your ticket early. Do it today. If you get all possibility, do it today. See the guys out there at the table afterwards. The reason being because they have to order the meat and the food early, a couple of weeks in advance. So uh, again, we can't. We've got to make sure that we uh, we had a good number, and uh, and our goal is to have a hundred. So th we need everybody, all of our men, the guys that are here. There's some guys that are not here today. Get all of this, our men. Bring somebody with you. We have. If you've never been to one of these events, it's out here on the grass in the yard. And under Easy Ups, we're asking if you have an Easy Up to bring it. And uh, it's a great time of fellowship. I've got uh, uh, someone sharing their testimony, and that is my nephew, who is a pastor in Florida. He's coming out that weekend, and, uh, uh, and uh, I'm going to have him share his testimony. He's, uh, his name's David Beagle. Huh? Some of you know my brother Scott. It's his son. David is, uh, David is the only relative I have that talks country. And he uses words like y'all. And he's a hunter, he's a fisherman, and he hunts all over. He lives in a very rural part. His church is, a, is in a rural part. I think they have probably 10,000 people in their whole county. And, uh, but he's a faithful preacher of the gospel and a young man that uh, has a heart for God. You'll want to hear his testimony growing up, what it meant to grow up in a preacher's home, but how he got saved and uh, gave his life to the Lord. All right, let's uh, dismiss in prayer. Brother Art, come and dismiss us, if you would, in prayer today. All right, well, I just want to thank the Lord for the word of God this morning, that we have his guidebook that we in our hands. That we don't have to guess what his will is. We don't have to guess what his will is for our lives. Lord, we just need to read your word and, and obey it. And the word today of baptism, Lord,
help us to be faithful to you for those that need to get baptized just to lay it on their heart again we're thankful that we have a pastor that preaches the word of god I ask your blessing now for the day that is left for us and in the week to come that we would just turn our hearts to you things we pray in jesus name amen <laughs>